Talking Poetics with Gareth Farmer. Episode 1, Andrea Brady. Welcome to the podcast Talking Poetics uh, with your host, me, Gareth Farmer. Talking Poetics is a forum for a detailed conversation with a poet about their work. And I asked my guests to select a number of their poems uh, from different stages of their writing career. They read them and we talk about them. Quite simple, really. Uh, During our conversation, I hope to introduce you, the listener, to the range of our guests' work, but also to unlock some of the ongoing themes, concerns and preoccupations and pervasive peccadilloes of their poetry in order to provide a broad picture of their work and its context. Today's guest is the poet, academic and lecturer, Andrea Brady. Hello, Andrea, and welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Andrea, Andrea is a professor of poetry at Queen Mary University of London in the UK. Born in Philadelphia, she studied at Columbia, then Cambridge, completing a PhD thesis on the latter as she writes, the interplay of poetics and ritual in the poetry of dying. Uh, This thesis became the 2006 book, Elegy, uh, English Funerary Elegy in the 17th Century Laws in Mourning. Andrea's uh, books of poetry include The Blue Split Compartment from Wesleyan, uh, 2021, The Strong Room from Crater, 2016, Domp Twos, in 2014, Cut from the Rushes, uh, 2013, Mutability, Scripts for Infants, Infancy, and Wildfire, a verse on es- obscurity and illumination, verse essay on obscurity and, and illumination. And her poetries have been translated into a number of languages and are the subject of circuit of critical essays, reviews, and other commentaries. And lastly, Andrea has produced a range of critical writing on poetry uh, from the 17th century to the present day and has become one of the UK's indispensable commentators on debates in poetry and poetics, uh, both in both academic and wider circles. Uh, And recent highlights include her, uh, well, not that recent actually anymore, uh, 2017 uh, British Academy talk called The Determination of Love, and her 2021 book, Poetry and Bondage, A History and Theory of Literary Constraint. Is it still called that or was that the that's yeah of lyric constraint in fact lyric lyric constraint great actually and that's another topic so speaking of constraints uh, one of the things in this broadcast is asking our poets to select very few uh, samples of their work for us to discuss and before we start reading these i wonder andrew if you could tell us about uh, the poems that you've selected today so I've kind of um, selected a, a, a range of poems based on books uh, book collections um the first one is from the book Wildfire, which I can speak a little bit more about as a, it was an essay on uh, Greek fire, on the uh, discovery of phosphorus as a, an industrial chemical, and about the history of, uh, of munitions involving um, both obscurity and illumination as white phosphorus is used as a, a kind of a smoke screen for uh, preventing troops from being seen in battle, but also as a thing that can be used on tracer fire to illuminate bullets as they pass through the battlefield. So that book is a, is really a kind of um, a long and extended consideration about of the uh, dynamics of fire, of burning, of um, aggression, but also the many discourses in which fire uh, operates. So philosophy, love poetry, and so forth. Um, and, it, and I chose that as a, as a poem to start with because I, uh, or a book to start with, because um, it, it really marked a turn in my practice away from more kind of occasional poetries, um, from a poetry that would be kind of responsive to the day's events or to what was happening in the news or to a sort of the seasonal cycles of, uh, of celebration and of, of, of darkness and light um, to a project that was much more focused on kind of research. So it wasn't dependent on inspiration and immediacy and spontaneous spontaneity, but more on an extended meditative practice and a lot of research in the archives. So I felt like in some ways that was one of my my first kind of mature works of, of, of poetry. Uh, uh, and so that's where I, I chose to start with. And then I can, um, each of the book projects that I'm going to highlight that came after that have a similar sort of, um, have, a, have a, an organizing principle or were approached as book projects rather than um, assemblages of, of more occasional verse. Yeah, so. and, 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 and um, perhaps when, when, you, when you introduce the text, you can talk about those in, in more detail. Mm. Um, the, the, the thing that I asked, well, I suppose one of the reasons I ask you the question because um, about the selections you've made today is because 
Um, it seems to me that your work has, has shifted, as you say, towards much more towards sequences and book projects than the occasional mm. poem in the past. And and I, I was reading about um, someone said that uh, I think it's Stephen Rodifer said that um, <laughs> you know uh, you, you're, you're never you're never going to rewrite as well as uh, you did when you were twenty, or you never write, you know mm. those sorts of things. You know, but that, and or uh, the notion that um, I think when we're younger uh, we write sort of yeah poems for occasions. Um, and these, um, I mean, had, so you didn't select, for example, you didn't select any of your earlier work for today's uh, podcast, which I was just interested in. Um, yeah. Is it because you want to sort of relinquish it or is there another reason? Um, I suppose because of the, the, you know, the subject who wrote those books feels more distant from me now. And um, I think that that's true. And it's, it's always lovely to be reminded of um, uh, Stephen Rodifer, who is, an eminent rogue and also a poet for who, for who's who, who's continued to, to in some ways cling on to the the, the juvenile spirit of, po of poetry as a disruptive force and um and and i think i know what he means that there is an intensity and an immediacy to the to the need to write poetry in in one's earlier life um and that for me came out very much of the circumstances in which i grew up and a feeling of, uh, uh, you know, this intense desire to escape a very kind of conformist and impoverished background and to find a world in which it was possible to recreate oneself um, uh, in intense contact with all of the kind of ideas and um, most passionate realities uh, that were available, however they might be discovered, and poetry was one of those ways. So, um, so yeah i have a, an immense uh sort of tenderness and commitment to those that early poetry even though i and i feel the loss of of, of um not being to, able to access those kinds of um moods essentially what they are the poetic moods that inspired me in those in those earlier poems in my later life but um i found ways to compensate which are really to focus more on the the kind of the extended project as a, as a different form of poetic thinking mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. So speaking of um, extended projects, um, perhaps we could, I could introduce, well, we could introduce the first selection, which is from Wildfire. And as you say, it's called A Verse Essay on Obscurity and the Illumination. So perhaps we could have a reading from this. Yeah. So this is from uh, uh, the section of the poem that um, is quite close to the beginning, and it's called Tunic, and I can say more about why it's called that later. Tunic. The hope drunk in which we dress ourselves for a day labor gaming with maximum power and killer graphics, taking it hard, the must haves this autumn whinge at the prison of the veil. Secularism is another orthodoxy we can't shake. To recognize the politics in fancy dress also buries its charge under the base, though the countdown is not due to start for you or your oldest child or for the slaves you inherit after that. Dress the wound in salted water as the salted water rises. Fashion turns dressing from repeat to a statement of interest, marking the day, mine one eternal need to keep out the cold. Garment of fire washed in boiling water or sandia decon foam. Judicial molestation in orange one piece or Walmart sweatshirt made by the guest workers in Vietnam Seeds of war in the outfits we array by the full-length mirrors of Bexamco and Diawusa. In the grove of war hangs a fleece of recycled Coke bottles, boob tubes, and desert grades, making out the farthest voyage from sunrise exports of Mumbai is in inevitable. We can do no more, vote with our feet dragged over the gap to Nikkei, though in the docks they tell of ears floating on the surface and a chin like a monkey's in the wash. The consumption loop is politics. Potential flashpoints all down the supply chains. The head stepped on lights, her gown before her maid knew it was happening. Everywhere she goes, she makes money. Can we break the news of repetition? The vulture supposed of nowhere, the target liver returning to the impact to look for any growth are given the shirts off their backs, washed out by tide, released from the burden of fertility and insecticide by a little powder, the tick-tock waves, the motive, the distance. Thank you, Andrea. Um, great reading. I'm always struck with your poetry that it's, there's a sort of, 
decorous diction crammed up against sort of the horrors and violence of, of horrible war language and fire and stuff like that. And you find that throughout the sequence, these, these sort of um, few confusional conf uh, fusion of registers throughout, throughout mm. which, which sort of are, are kind of crushed together. You know, this um, in the grove of the war hangs a fleece of recycled coke bottles. That's a very, mm. very vivid line. Mm, mm. And one of the things that this book of poems was trying to do was really trace these kind of mythographies of of, of burning. Um, and so there's a lot of references in this poem to kind of to, to mythical history. So the tunic is picking up the image of Hercules's tunic. So uh, Hercules essentially created the first chemical weapons because he dipped his arrows in the blood of the Hydra and used those arrows to um, uh, to to shoot a troop of centaurs. Um, so toxicon, um, the Greek word for poison comes from toxon or arrow. So I was thinking about projectiles and about poison and, and, and so forth. Um, and that story really resonated because um, in a number of ways, because um, Hercules then um, wounds Chiron, one of the kind of chief old centaurs uh, um, who had taught everyone the use of medicine. And in revenge, Chiron, um, uh, 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 gets um, uh, a kind of poison. Um, what well, he he well, so Chiron um, uh, asks to give up his immortality uh, because he's in so much pain. And then later on in the story, um, in revenge for this attack on the centaurs, um, Hercules is given uh, by his wife a garment in an airtight um, container, which is has been soaked in this the same poison, um, and. Uh, his wife is told, well, if he puts this on, he'll love you forever, etc. And as soon as he puts it on, he feels this intense pain and burning. So he throws himself on, um, on, a, on the fire because he'd rather be burned alive than experience it anymore. And so this idea of a kind of a, a, a tunica molesta or a punishing garment um, is quite central to the poem because it's tracing in some ways the history of white phosphorus, which is this, you know, as a substance when it gets on your skin, nothing can put it out. Um, you're supposed to wash the wounds with salted water, but um, but it will burn down to the bone, you know, and it's the, it creates this really intense pain and terrible burns. Um, there are connections then also between that story and um, uh, and Medea, who also gives somebody a, a, a poisoned tunic that um, that catches on fire, um, and um, and with the story of Prometheus. So I guess those different registers are, are reflecting that you know there are these these quite you know ancient histories around around militarized violence and its connection to to eroticization, which is a, a, a theme that comes up in my work um, a fair amount, and we might come back to it when we talk about my most recent book, The Blues Book Compartments. Um, but yeah, so so um, thinking about the kind of mythopoetic um, as it persists in the modern day. Um, and therefore also is resonant with contemporary military language and the, um, the kind of metaphoric use of um, ancient myth, you know, Operation Gorgon and things like that that you get in contemporary drone operations, um, establishing this kind of weird continuity, right, between the the, the ancient past and the, the ultra modern. Um, mm. So that, that's yeah, no. the grove of war. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's fascinating to hear all these um, amazing sort of interesting context for, for the for the for the production of this poem. I mean, well, one of the things I sort of always think about, in particular with wildfire, and and I think you've written about this before, is you know there is the mythopoetic, but then there's the actual, uh, and it's and I think there's a sense, and you know, or, or let's let's put it this way: there's the allegory, and then there's the allegorizing mm -hmm. of the actual. And I think that there's a resistance in your work to sort of not just leave it at you know this thing resembles. A mythic story mm. but to, mm. and i think that's where the contemporary language of warfare comes in is that it's a sort of like yeah we can think about these things uh, let's say poetically but actually these sorts of uh war mythographies are still going on uh, mm. which actually somehow um sometimes preclude well firstly they, they enable the politicians to sort of put themselves into a sort of like this is uh, inevitable this war you know um, because mm. we are fighting for history history you know history will never lie but also you sort of want you're kind of drawing attention to the sort of disingenuousness of the sort of when you place stories up into these kind of myth mythological things yeah uh, how actually that can uh preclude our understanding or appreciation of the horrors of actuality 
Mm, mm. Yeah. And, you know, I suppose thinking about what I just said about the, the resonance between kind of contemporary military usage and, and ancient um, mythological uh, languages and images, um, that I guess that sounds like it places me within a kind of high modernist tradition of, you know, going back to um, the Greeks and, and, and developing these kind of world historical uh, poetic systems, um, and which is not exactly how I, I experience it. It's more about trying to dig into this very knotted mess of, of, of kind of continuity and the, and the li limits of the political and the social imagination that they imply as well. Um, so what is it about this tangle of, of kind of um, uh, symbols and associations that we have around fire, around um, being around the projectile um, uh, that that stops us from better managing these technologies that are uh, have such atrocious consequences, right? So thinking about um, fire and the way that it's also regulated by law um, uh, is, is another aspect of the poem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you describe wildfire as, as you've already said about as a verse essay on obscurity and illumination. You've said a little bit about this, and as you put it in the notes of the text, this verse essay is quote trying to persuade us to recognise that certain catastrophes and uh, felicities are not inevitable. Uh, can you just talk a little bit? Because I'm really interested in this notion of a verse essay and and mm. where you think it what it's doing, <laughs> as it were. Mm. You know? Yeah, and that some kind of comes back to what we we were starting off with is this um, uh, uh, desire to push beyond the kind of immediacy of the the, the closed lyric moment of um, you know the perception, the revelation, the the finish, um, and into um, a, a a longer and more expansive um, form, not just um, form on the page, but also a form of thinking, um, and um and wondering about the kind of uh mania of productivity that's sometimes implied in um our poetic practice which is uh, you know about just constantly generating um perceptions and responses to the day-to-day -day, um and wanting to step outside of that um mania into a space where um longer and more determined kinds of reflections could take place um so so yeah, I guess the um, you know the the verse essay or the longer form um, verse you know going back to people like Pope um, has a, it is quite an old tradition, but even for you know further back to Cicero or whoever um, uh, that has been really neglected within what is sometimes described as the lyricization of contemporary poetry, right? That mm. that. Um, we now think of poetry entirely as lyric. Um, when, we, when we think of what a poem is, we think of it as we think of the lyric poem, um, and its its kind of brevity, its concision, its economies um, have become have crowded out every other kind of poetic thinking um, and tradition. So, yeah, so the book was kind of a return to some of those older and more expansive models. Um, as um, and. <clears throat> One of the things that I, I did was, uh, you, uh, as I do throughout my practice, was really made a, a lot of use of found text and um, a lot of quotations, and you can see them um, marked in the text. And in the original version, those were also hyperlinked, which feels like a very ancient kind of technology now. But well, On a CD-ROM. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so, because the idea was that um, it might be possible both to read the poem in its entirety and to kind of puzzle out its meanings independently, but that if there were um, particular anecdotes or histories there that um, uh, felt like, you know, they warranted further investigation, you could just kind of click on them and, and then get lost yourself into in, a, in, in an archival journey. Um, <clears throat> and I, I guess in some ways I was, um, that's a kind of a response to um, uh, certain poetic cultures in the UK, which are associated with intense intellectualism and for which, you know, in order to really read and understand the poetry, you need to have done, replicated the research, uh, you know, and read all of the same books um, as bizarre and um, unforthcoming as they are, as the poet had read. And that wasn't my intention. And, I, you know, uh, I don't assume that everyone has that kind of um, scholarly time when they're when they're reading a, a book of poems. So it was really about wanting to, um, through the pleasures of connection, 
um, that are established by the poetry to get people interested in these very weird um, uh, histories and um, points of connection. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of stuff in this book about livers because um, Prometheus and the liver and the renewing liver and the you know bringing of fire, but also um, unlike uh, other kinds of burns, phosphorus burns cause liver damage. And there just, there seem to be almost anticipations of reality that could not have been known that are manifest in these these myths. And I think that I, that feels kind of delightful and curious to me as well as being um, often really horrendous. Mm. Thank you, Andrew. We should um, go to your next um, uh, se selection. I just, I did want to say that um, I, I thought it was really <clears throat> novel actually the way in which you use quotations in Wildfire because you use a single um, open uh, quotation. Uh, and so rather than ending the quotation, I thought that was really interesting because you're sort of giving over to the fact that this is found language, but it's 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 raveling into your own, as it were. Mm. I thought that was a very formal, interesting way. Have you done that before, or is that something you sort of invented for this? No, I invented it for this uh, because I wanted to allow the, the quotations to kind of unravel into the verse and for it not to be clear where they kind of began and end. And also being cognizant of the the, the, the quite severe kind of uh, rhythmic interruption that can sometimes be uh, caused by punctuation, especially quotation marks. So, so if you read something like Alice Notley's The Descent of Alette, you know, the, there's so many quotation marks in it that it, it, you're constantly being kind of juddering along through the, through the verse. And I wanted there to be a little bit more kind of smoothness and continuity to it. Um, but thinking about, thinking about the rhythms of reading and the, um, both of my own performed readings, but also the, the reader's silent or spoken reading um, is really important to me. And so I spend a lot of time thinking about line breaks and and, and mise en page and things like that too. Mm, and that comes back actually in, in your <clears throat> um, latest collection, Spit Car Conformances, and we, we can talk about that as well. And um, perhaps we can turn to your next selection, which is from Mutability Scripts for in Infancy. And it was published by Seagull Books in uh, 2012. I wonder if you could say uh, something about this before you read it. Yeah, so this is a very different kind of project, um, which uh, constitutes basically some notes and poems that I wrote during the first few years of my eldest child's life. Um, and um, uh, there are a couple of references to being pregnant with my second child in there. So which uh, was so it's those sort of first three years of my eldest's life. Um, and uh, it, it felt like a very different kind of project. Um, turning away from the, the the kind of quite public and political um, uh, uh, meditations of books like wildfire to a much more private setting and a setting which is very fraught um, for the I think the the woman writer to to address and that's the scene of domesticity of of mothering and of reproduction so you know it was it was such a um, you know an absolutely overwhelming experience that I wanted to kind of record some aspect of it. And yet the, the rhythms of life with an infant, as people may know, really preclude the kind of extended thinking that we were talking about in relation to, to wildfire. So it was based on kind of notes and uh, notes on reading that I was doing because um, I read masses of psychoanalysis and um, anthropology and so forth in order to think about the, the, the situation of of mothering um, in a way that was uh, more interesting and productive than the kind of mothering manuals that um, that you know you normally for are forced upon you when you first have a baby. So, um, so it it felt like a, a turn to a very private space and a very kind of fraught space um, and uh, one which I didn't really ha know how to address from a position of kind of. Um, ethical or political righteousness. And actually that was a really useful experiment because even now when I'm reading bits of wildfire, I'm hearing the, the, a, a kind of a, a, a dominant tone of irony, which has been critiqued in my work by um, my friend Robin Purves and something I've thought about a lot of, of that ironic relation to the, the subject of the text. And here it wasn't possible really to have quite an ironic relation to the subject, which was my relation to my daughter. Um, and yet, at, you know, all at the same time, recognizing that there were many models uh, of for women of women writing and making art out of those those first few years with an infant, 
Um, Mary Kelly's postpartum document was uh, is something that's referenced in the poem that we're about to read. Um, but also that uh, it felt like a really significant um, political experience. And that's not just about the kind of alienation and uh, gendering of, of reproductive labor. Um, it was also about recognizing um, the intense um, interdependence of within the mother infant dyad um, as a profound challenge to the notion of autonomous individuality and the the adult male citizen um, on which so much political philosophy is based it was really just this kind of i mean it sounds quite obvious but just this shocking awareness that actually subject the subject is not one right it's um, it begins as a mess of two, and it takes a really long time to untangle um, the, the 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 subject and the the physicality, but also the the emotional um, and life and imaginative life of of the the parent from the child, and that to me felt really profound um, and something that I wanted to to try to annotate um, as I experienced it. Okay, so let's um, hear some of these annotations. <clears throat> What is the function of this text? Where does it go? You skim along my skin, electric in my nerve endings. So why do I need to remember you in translation? Reading backwards, I'm reminded of the detail of being with you and being yours and you being who you are, inscrutable, incipient. How many details have I already forgotten in the exactitude of your presentness? When I tell people what I'm doing, they cast around politely, dejectedly, recommend a postpartum document. Every discovery has its concept. But what if the note, record of zeal overflowing, sponges off your initiate life? Narcissism parading as detail, looking both ways before crossing the troubled line between domesticity and action, home and writing, lines which up till now have felt too dangerously electrified even to approach. The chronic absenteeism of a political critique must have its letter. <clears throat> Descent. Counting the year in wash tabs in kilos of white fat and brown, I upbraid the kitchen, though it serves my desires. We cook you up, knowing the chemistry is irreversible and the past evaporates under any sky, harming you into being survivably indifferent. This is the holding order as we hold the outrageous truths of the future against you, a state of confusion which doubles their tenacity into an obsession. Not remembering the first time I learned about murder, it becomes now the meat sore around which play wraps a layer of sweet health. To cook an egg imperfectly, to solder the remedies which have nothing to do with that into a shape like a helmet, I fit it under my top. I can throw over this whole house a grid ordered on repeat from my usual suppliers, and it will count everything against a pain clicker. Someday you will be inducted, and the ragged object flying before your eyes, kaleidoscope in blood the material you knew. But you'll see nothing new. You started out a creature of trade. You get your best terms, fight your poverty with greed and violent sound. Until you can state yourself, I would be lying if I left you alone with the angels. It's easier to make a house a charnel than to represent us together, swimming under the sign for joy. <clears throat> Thank you, Andrea. Um, it's, it's really great to hear you read it. I mean, I, I, I um, as you know, I mean, I, I really love this text um, and, and I've written and thought about it a lot. Um, one of the things that really interests me about this, and it, it goes back to what you were saying earlier, is this notion of you not, <sighs> not wanting to trade on your daughter's life, to create poetry, to, I mean, there's lots about trading, commodification, uh, this splitting up of subjects uh, in this text. And, and, and I, I, I'm not gonna say irony because it's not ironic, but there's a sort of sense of, uh, well, a playfulness with how far you are gonna, like what's the status of this text and what are you doing to your daughter as it were, or how you're using the details of this life to create something. You say at the beginning of this um, sequence, you know, what is the function of this text? Mm -hmm. um, and what, what I find interesting in, in relation to that is the sense in, in is again, this, this <coughs> the shift of registers we have here. So 
the the sense in which you have prose bits <laughs> and then um, uh, the poetic sequences. So uh, which are kind of trading trading amongst themselves, you know, that one, one is, you know, uh, one is sort of a, a sort of a fight for, I don't know, register or fight for voice. So I wonder, sorry, I wonder if you could say something about this kind of trading on the details of life and, and, and the sort of, uh, let's say, um, uh, infidelities or, or, or uh, infelicities of sort of using a subject like your, your daughter, as it were, to create mm. a poet. Po to create a poetic sequence. Yeah. Can say something about that. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the end of Wildfire, um, there's a there's a poem which talks about obscurity um in, in poetry and the need to speak clearly in order to be to to address political urgencies. And um at least sometimes. And in this group of poems, it was as if I was trying to speak clearly and directly. And I tend to do that perhaps more, more obviously in, in the prose sections. Um, and to banish some of that kind of obscurity, which had become started to feel defensive. So this is a very open and a very kind of um, intimate book. Um, and that talks about postpartum sex and um, uh, insomnia and the difficulties of breastfeeding and all, all of those kinds of things. Um, but at the same time, I felt like I was com confronted with the obscurity of my child um, or what Edward Gleason might talk about is the opacity, you know, in, in a very different context, but the right to opacity. And did Isla have a right to uh, to be opaque to me, you know, as attending so carefully to her, um, her needs and drawing conclusions about her discovery of her senses or, you know, her ability to start to manipulate objects in the world, which feels like a very, a tremendously, you know, interesting uh, phenomenological kind of moment um, that you get to witness of this baby lying on a, on a play mat, you know, with playing with an octopus or something. Um, and, and yet at the same time, recognizing that um, she was her own subject and would want to invent herself in her own ways um, as she got older and so not wanting to kind of colonize that space with all of my projections and interpretations um, and to to allow her some of that kind of right to opacity um, but you know at the same time i was i was reading a lot of winnicott at the at the time and I, winnicott is someone who i find um really interesting and helpful the idea of that you know the the good enough mother is one who kind of at first creates a world of illusion for the uh, for the infant, but then allows them to become disillusioned. Um, and that it's um, only by being disillusioned because our needs are not being fully met that we can discover our own self and also the capacity for creativity. Um, Winnicott was very uh, is, is, is great on the creativity of the the infant. He has very little to say about the creativity of the of the mother. So it was a, that was kind of something that I was really dwelling in um and in a way there's not there there are some commonalities to the the wildfire project in that there are allusions to all sorts of um texts in here to paintings um uh quotations from wordsworth and you know other poets writing about infancy um but at the same time i i wanted to kind of banish some of that intellectual apparatus and in order to really be focused um on the constantly disappearing moments of revelation that that are ha that were happening, you know, on the play mat or or in the in the bed where I was feeding the, my baby, so um, so it felt like a very it did feel like in some ways quite a spontaneous kind of text, um, a very I mean, responsive yeah. one. Sorry, you, you you do talk about the dangerous lucidity of the text, you know, the sort of the um, and I think by by danger you mean sort of. Uh, at the risk of sort of letting down um, cryptic poets and you know high high modernist poets, you know sort of how can we write directly when we need to write intellectually and cryptically about these things? You know? mm. um, and I quite like that. But just going back to this notion of um, uh, articulating or expressing these moments between you and your daughter in a, in an essay um, that you write um, on Denise Riley's critical and creative work, you you write <laughs> um, you write about. Um, Denise's amazing kind of work on impersonal passion in the impersonality of language. And in particular, what you argue is that um, Denise Riley's sort of pragmatic theory of language and the notion that there's no way out of interpolations, as she says, 
and there's and and that you know language does everything for us and, and is us as it were um and that you seem to sort of suggest that her work and i think yours in this sequence in others um a way out of this kind of bind of interpolation and perhaps by extension this sort of way of interpolating your daughter in language as it were and and expressing everything for her that um mm. is intimacy so way out of it intimacy tenderness um and uh communality and those mm. moments of affect that can't quite be that do slip away from the sort of imperialism of interpolated language mm. um, and i think that i think that um your work seems to be um grappling with that about that the, with the let's say the theoretical notion and the actuality that language you know you can't escape language but it's it seems to in moments of intimacy um that that you can and that, that the this is happening in this sequence mm, mm. yeah it's interesting to uh to draw it back to um, denise riley's work because there's a quote from well there's a there's a, a line in this poem that i've just read that's influenced by her poem dark looks so the um, the shape like a helmet um, reminds me of the bit where she talks about the kitchen colander. It turns out it's neat, very mocked helmet of brown rice. Um, and Riley's work is someone who's, you know, has been really important to me. And, and you know, um, War in the Nursery is also a space where Riley's engaging with that, that same sort of history of psychoanalysis that I was just alluding to. Um, and yeah, I did write about um, the gap in a way between uh, her her theory and her poetics um and i and and in some ways the the severity of the the theory that is i think belied by the um the capacities that are that she can um access within her her poetry um and you know that that was also part of the context of the the kind of dangerous lucidity or what felt like a dangerous lucidity of writing the this book because coming out of a kind of um, uh, more recently out of a British avant-garde tradition, which was completely homosocial and dominated by men and by certain elite institutions. Before that, having begun to explore the um, kind of the poetics of the New York school, but you know, the earlier generations of New York school, which also had really problematic relations around women i hadn't I, you know it took me a while to discover models for um for really uh intense interesting uh poetic writing by women about about mothering you know um and riley might be one of those people else not least somebody else who i i mentioned earlier bernadette mayer um diane de prima someone who i've been thinking about more recently um so so in some ways it was like you know it felt like a confrontation with the that anxiety of influence of, of those kind of um, quite patriarchal poetic contexts that I had emerged from to, to write this this book, um, but all the more reason to do it. <laughs> mm, yeah, and it's I mean it's been you know incredibly well received, um, and as, as, as and and it's a sort of beautiful stage in your your poetic development. I think you know that sounds a bit um, patronizing, but you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. Thank you. Yeah, um, but we should, um, but pe perhaps we should get to your next selection then, which is from the Strong Room, which was published by um, Creative Press in <clears> 2016. <throat> As I admitted to you, sort of off camera, um, I don't know actually. I don't actually know that much about the Strong Room. Um, yeah. and I don't know why I haven't read it, which is ridiculous. But um, I do know that, that, and you might contradict me on this, but it, it features meditations on violence, masculinity, sleeplessness. Uh, among other things and the blurb mm -hmm. states that many of the poems are charms against damage mm. uh, which perhaps we can talk about perhaps we can perhaps you can introduce the text to us and then we can talk about some of these themes afterwards yeah sure um so having made a big thing about how all the, the the collections that i was going to be speaking about were kind of developed as projects this book really uh only made itself clear as a project after it was assembled so uh, it was a series of kind of more more occasional poems but it was also th thinking through um uh the, the the later stages of my my mothering so ha having had two boys um after I, I had a daughter and um and it incorporates a lot of the kind of the language and um the rhythms of our our, our life together um and thinking much more also about about gender and about masculinity and recognizing that in this um what felt like a very disturbing way to me that i had a tendency to elide 
some aspects of my boys learning and and behavior which is that was completely normal um uh with some of the kind of political violence that was pressing in on us um, as a family. And um, the poem that I'm going to read from All My Sons is this is a selection from that poem, um, but it's it's typical of the collection in that it's thinking, it, it's making use of almost in an anachreontic way of a lot of the the, the weird and wonderful language of the, of the kids and the way that they were perceiving the world, but also putting that against a backdrop of, um, of really harrowing um, political events. So the bombings in Syria, but also accounts of, um, uh, uh, of a, a, a terrible instance of, of, of child abuse um, that emerged at about the moment that I was writing the poem. Um, so, so it's thinking about, you know, uh, my, the, the girl that I start, I'll, I'll, I'll start off by speaking is, is my daughter who, you know, it's thinking about her sort of fierceness and of her, of her um, uh, her fighting spirit, but also her asthma and the way that, um, you know, she would have really been close to dying had it not been for access to the NHS um, and about a time that she went um, paragliding in, in, in France because she was obsessed with dragons and we wanted to give her the chance to fly. But then at the same time, you know, that so that is a very <laughs> kind of um, uh, not idealizing, but, you know, uh, an, an image of, of girlhood, which is about strength, perseverance and, and resilience and um, a capacity to exceed boundaries, you know, and then thinking about um, my own relation to um, to masculinity and my ten my my dis more disciplinary tendencies in relation to my boys and um, the kinds of fears that um, uh, there are normal expressions of childhood aggression or whatever would kind of provoke in me. So it's kind of trying to work through what again felt like um, a very exposing and vulnerable territory um, in which my own uh, ethical and political subjectivity was um, was felt very ex exposed. Um, so, yeah. <clears throat> so this is from the strong room from all my sons. All my sons. The girl must be a peshmerga, boar spear, or dragon. She chooses the blue and white sail and circles indefinitely above the angle on. These fierce and slender limbs climb jugs and divots. She flies, breaking nuance among the pine tops, but would be the child I lost, her lungs scissored by an epoch, or she goes out drowned in scarlet. The boys are also ones I would have lost, and may yet, the pitiless front of their jammies maps every place that is not a target. It is the single dinosaur who might have evolved into a man, but is now a relic they d dig out of bricks for fun. The box overhead shows a heaven made in ash. They grow towards it, forcing a trope of fear as a thing to be managed or blamed. I saw the heavies of special branch in the departure lounge, guarded by seven gates and seven crowns. They chose the boys for their ballistic look and the girls as slaves who fell through that fabled hole in their bodies. Waking up with a sword, smashing the wrist with trucks. I snatch him away. He's been flipping his brother. His whole body shakes and can't be held in fear of my outrageous discipline. He asks only for special time riding the 38 in a loop, London's carbolic sky full of canaries and cancer. We agree each chapter must end with booby trap. At night, his head rests on owls. He consoles himself picking out carbine stars and multiplying them by larger numbers, sketching out groups of fish and cupcakes and imagining filling the toad. What is the number before infinity? What does produce mean? that the art of holding is palliative and no one need live having lost her sparkle. We waterboard amoxicillin, owning the good, we claw back his shut face to make up that good with sweet night gardens, believing we are rescuing their ears. The analyst saw this child as an artist whom the mother records, shouts into oblivion, wishes to repair sometimes like a clock, the singular complexity she keeps is shoved off, anxiously needed. But he recoiled from being fed on too, retreated into the hollow trunk of a tree 
where none could command him to communicate, a prince of lost countries. Smiling over the field of poppies like a good witch, their mothers feed them with their own image, which is the lie of their harmlessness, which puts them to sleep instead of killing them. That is a strong place. Like Socrates, the baby tied to his pushchair waits in his bedroom with a blanket covering his head for death. The child drifting in and out of reality in his bedroom with pythons and rats, his wrists held by wires to the fire guard and nothing will save him. The sky bulges with giant bullets, but only an individual wretches bringing nothing up but the desire to know nothing again. I must get back to my own. The only consolation of mornings like this one is that their damage can be so easily held. <clears throat> Thank you, Andrea. Um, so great to hear that these uh, poems are read. Um, the, 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 the abiding theme here that keeps on coming up to me is this notion of harm, uh, harm um, and sort of trying to hold off, I mean, obviously there are many in here, but trying to hold off harm uh, from perhaps um, from speaking from my own perspective the sort of toxicity of masculinity and having to use um the language of masculinity and and being in a world that's sort of so um so suffused by kind of i don't know masculine aggression um and it's sort of uh, the 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 imagery the images of your sort of little boys with their jammies you know and their dinosaur jammies and and the innocence there's something in your poetry it seems this poem in particular that's, that wants to to hold hold that innocence and let it breathe um, before it gets sort of toxified uh, mm -hmm. by by the culture. I mean, what if, what if you could say something about that about harm and trying to uh, preserve that innocence? Yeah, yeah, and also of um, you know of other children who are exposed to to harm in different ways, and so there's a bit about being in a you know a departure lounge for a. Um, for a flight and seeing a special branch coming in and trying to choose, to pull out people that they thought were were going off to either fight as jihadi in 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 Syria or to be you know jihadi brides as they were called at the time, um, and and also about a, a, a story of a of a little boy who was you know kept kind of chained up um, and and so you know then there's a reference to, to hiding um, in the, in the poem as well and. Um, uh, it's kind of playing off of Winnicott's I idea that it is a joy to be hidden, but it's disaster not to be found. Um, and that is something we could apply to poetry, I guess, and its obscurities that it's, you know, there's a joy in the hiding of, of sense within this kind of um, rich texture of, of language, but it's a disaster if the sense is never found and that, um, you know, people aren't able to, to, to kind of get through somehow that, um, the, the 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 linguistic surface to actually find the meaning um but you know i was also thinking about you know little bit charles the second hiding in the in the trunk of a tree to escape escape an army after um the, the defeat of his father um and even sort of aerial and and um being trapped in a tree in in the tempest um and so thinking about again that now this the home as a space which was both um an attempt to guard and to um, to, to guard against damage and to create um, a safe space of safety where you know every corner has been rubberized and every uh, even the spoons are kind of soft and plastic um, and um, and yet the the kinds of harm which are intrinsic to the familial relation which is again of course one of the great themes of psychoanalysis and which really prevents us from having any kind of um, innocent idealism about that that kind of parent child dyad that I was speaking about earlier as something other than a space where the kind the, the you know intense physical sexual and other conflicts are being played out all the time um and so you know but at the same time um there was a sense of int of intense um fear and exposure which i think was really revived um in in for me recently with the with the war in ukraine and um you know the prospect of of nuclear war and you know, that was something I was thinking about a lot when Trump became president is sort of now it's not just what happens if the whole human race is wiped out, but what are the precise steps that I would take to try to keep my family safe if I knew a nuclear bomb were about to fall on London, which is a totally neurotic fantasy, but one that kept me awake at night, like thinking, what should I put in my bag and where should we go and everything like that. 
Um, and so there's a sense of a kind of a different, a different kind of exposure to, um, to, uh, the, to, to larger political violence that comes through um, this uh, intense love for small and vulnerable people um, that the poems are, are kind of meditating on and which really continues to preoccupy me. So it, there is um, a, a, both a reorientation and a reintensification of my political commitments that comes through parenting um, uh, and feeling that, you know, that, that part of my, my own self and my, my, my heart is exposed in the fact that my, my kids are wandering around in this world, which is getting far too hot for anybody to really inhabit anymore. Um, but then at the same time, wanting to question the kinds of um, privileges that make mothering the site at which um, uh, a more intensely personal um, uh, 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 engagement with these political risks is exposed. Um, and uh, so there's another poem in the book that I could have read, which is a, um, about Trayvon Martin and thinking about this rush uh, both to identify with Trayvon Martin by some people who said, you know, it could have been me, and then a rush to not identify with him. So a lot of privileged white people saying, well, I could not have been Trayvon Martin because I have all of these kinds of structural privileges that mean I would have been safe in that gated community. I would have been safe walking down that rainy street. Um, and um, and, the, and the sort of the, the almost the savior fantasy that is not just an aspect of that, um, that, that nuclear war scenario I was just talking about, but also in that moment of George Zimmerman's trial, thinking, well, could I have been on that jury? Could I have persuaded everyone to convict him or, or, or whatever? And, um, and, and recognizing the kind of obscenity of, of um, trying to inject oneself personally into these, these scenes of, of um, harm, you know, in, in the street, in police violence, um, uh, in war and, and elsewhere. Um, and assuming that you, you wouldn't be a, 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 a contributor to that, to that massification of violence. Um, when in fact, in your relations with your own kind, you know, in the home, you're already um, in some ways exercising exactly those forms of domination and, and oppression that you're, that I am critiquing in the, in the poetry at large. So that was kind of the dynamic. It was a very messy, or it was intended to be at least a very messy um, inquisition into the, the aggression within the family, the aggression within that wider space, the identification and the, the proposing of the child, you know, the reproductive futurity as the, the reason for investment in, in, in remedying the, 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 all of the, the, the broken aspects of the world. Um, but then also pulling back from that and, and, and holding up a little bit of a mirror to, um, to the, the aggression, which is, which is latent in, in, I think, in all of our relations. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting when you're talking about that, um, it sort of segues to the next, the next, um, uh, the next sequence that you've um, read, which we should get to actually uh, in a sec, but just this notion of bearing witness and the complicities of bearing witness uh, mm. and the complicity of, and also the, the bad thinking in some ways or the disingenuousness of sort of, sort of try, either trying to place yourself in, in the shoes of X, Y, and Z person in a war zone or in sort of, um, in, in privileging yourself in the sense that you can't do that. Uh, and there's, a, and there's, and I think that, that your, your poetry in using a range of voices and bringing in a range of perspectives seems to kind of outflank that uh, sort of bad faith of lyricism in the sense of, oh, the war is going on and what can I do? And I, here I am sitting with all my privileges, because actually it's not that, it's more complicated than that. You know, we, there's an empathetic dimension, a communality, a sociality, uh, uh, to our understanding of human human beings in, uh, in other places that, that we can and cannot uh, empathize with. And I think that we're sort of, you think through a lot of these states without allowing one to, you know, take over. And I think that's what happens in your work. And, and a, lot, a lot of that comes down to voice, I think, about the voices that you choose to use. And this, this is my segue, really, voice, into um, Blue Split Compartments, which is your next um, 
thing, which was published by Wesleyan University Press in uh, 2021. Um, so yeah, I mean, before we get to your reading of it, I wonder if you could tell us about its composition and, and its, its makeup and, and how you created it and where some of these voices are from in, in, this, in this poem. Yeah, so this is really an extended um, meditation on that question around uh, on witnessing and the impasse between the desire to witness, but also um, desire not to um, to inject oneself artificially into a scene of someone else's kind of grief. Um, and it's a po book of poems about drone operations, um, and it, it, it's been uh, in process for quite a long time. Most of it was actually written during the Obama administration, and that's because Obama was the person who really drastically expanded drone operations, in part because he said that he was committed to closing Guantanamo Bay, which he did not do. But as a consequence, he didn't have anywhere to put the uh, the militants who were um, being uh, targeted by the US military. And so those people were assassinated instead. And um, although it does shade over into the Trump presidency, I thought it was quite important actually uh, to focus on Obama and to try to disturb a little bit that kind of hagiography hey, around Obama as um, you know, a good guy, a good president, look at what we lost when we got this clown, uh, et cetera. Um, so uh, it has, it's, it's um, a series of poems which have just four different titles, open, activated, frozen, and closed. Those are the states of the kill box, which is a kind of military notion that of a kind of a three dimensional space um, in which military operations take place. So whereas we uh, uh, traditionally uh, military engagement was thought about in a kind of two dimensional space of you know, fronts and, and uh, armies engaging each other on the ground, um, thinking about the kill box as a as a um, a three dimensional space allows them to coordinate air air power as as part of it, but it's also um, a space that can be um, temporarily opened, popped open, um, activated as a, um, a a space where um, military operations are uh, lethal lethal forces is legal in its use and then closed again. So rather than having to go through official political declarations of confrontation. Um, or having a recognizable front, this is a much more kind of spontaneous and momentary opening of zones of conflict anywhere in the world. So it's really, you know, the ultimate kind of notion of privilege. Um, and I was thinking about that form in relation to the form of the lyric poem um, as a space also, which can kind of pop open spontaneously in the ways that I was kind of critiquing um, uh, in, at the start of our, our conversation. Um, and so it's thinking a lot about drone operations, it's thinking about the intimacy that the drone pilot experiences between him or herself and the target or object as they are called in military language. They feel that they're, you know, just 18 inches away from the scene, even though they're thousands of miles away. It's thinking about prosthetic violence, about um, notions that the drone pilot is a castrated version of a of a of a real pilot because they're not putting themselves at risk in the um, field of, of operations um, and just about this capacity to affect people's lives over huge distances so about both intimacy and distance um, as a different kind of pairing than the obscurity and illumination one that we, we started our conversation with thank you andrea so mm -hmm. this is from blue split compartments Activated. In the eschatological tradition, the prey carries his death upon his person. And this is very painterly, but not adequate protection, recognizing the frequency of Apache deep attacks. I can find no way around the thicket of laws and precedents. My mom's boyfriend and my uncle forced me to try out the gun, not the one that lay curled up in his sock drawer with the porn mags, another one at Indian oil fields against the cans. I didn't want to hold it, the heaviness repulsive to my hand, the kickback a joke on me. They said, you need to know how, but not why, which stalker would back me up the stairs and what they imagined was his color. They said, this is how country people live. My uncles harboring in the trees, drawing their enormous bows were relative aristocrats giving the prey its chance, taking theirs, striking a line through the history of this land of men armed 
in blinds, bloody against nature. <clears throat> Closed. Turns out I'm really good at killing people. Didn't know that was going to be a strong suit of mine. Hear how shallow this Molobros is, like an old furnace woman. I'd hit him with both my hands and knock all the teeth out of his mouth onto the ground, like a pig gobbling up our corn and munitions. Feeling nauseous from the switchbacks, my son looks out and says, that man has moved in death, but his heart will not stop falling into his stomach. He's been blooded, just like you would a hunting dog. I never needed to advertise my reproductive fitness by running around, trapping animals, bringing them home. My belly is round and intact, except for the split up its center where the muscles won't adhere anymore since I had the children, leaving my guts spilling out onto the field of blood and treasure. So like most women, I hate this war, smoking the remains, hanging my head over the fire. Thank you, Andrew. First, it's sort of visceral, <laughs> visceral uh, imagery yeah. here uh, and voices. I I'm going to ask you three questions about this. <laughs> um, we're, we're sort of uh, we're coming up towards the end of the show, but I wanted to ask you three questions about this. The first, the first is about um, voice voices and extracts. You know, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit. I, I recognise one voice, but only because you've told me it um, in, in the past um, about who who says this. So wh where the te where some of this text is from. The second is about. These, this is a re uh, repeated theme in your work, uh, the sort of imperialistic wars uh, and a warfare in particular. And it's, so, for example, in, in Quid 9, all that, all, that long, all that long time ago, you wrote, wrote a wonderful essay called Grief Work in a War Economy, mm. uh, which was about, and you were talking about how writers after 9-11 sort of were trading on this to sort of find what you call transcend, uh, transcendent uh, legitimacy somehow you know um based upon based upon a sense of freedom we are free from this type of stuff and you know we are not them um so um and there's a you you were exploring in that essay that sort of radical uncertainty between the indiv individual impulse to write and bear witness but also political agency solidarity and responsibility so that's the second part and the other thing is about performance there's something something i think's changed in your work and in particular with this is that you it's it's a lot your work's a lot more open and, and when I, this reading in particular, and when I saw you read this poem, uh, excerpts from this book as well, I felt that um, you, were, you were eliciting, trying to elicit the audience a lot more uh, in being involved in your work. So that's just three, three parts. If you could answer very quickly, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, so the first question, different voices. There are references in the, um, the poem that I just read to uh, Quotes from Obama that turns out I'm really good to be really good at killing people. That's that's Obama or um, uh, uh, he's been blooded like a hunting dog. That's something that his um, uh, national security advisor, John Brennan, said about him. There's also uh, quotes from the Odyssey. So the Molobros furnace woman, that's that's about Odysseus when he's trying to get back to um, to Ithaca, you know, in disguise. Um, so the poem is also, this is also a poem which is full of found text drawn from a lot of drone operation, like um, manuals, military manuals, um, chat logs and, and, and uh, histories of drone operations and so forth, um, as well as quotations from uh, witnesses and victims, um, which I tended to insert without any kind of um, uh, kind of poetic apparatus around them, although they're in a poem, so that's automatically an apparatus. Um, and thinking about the ways that 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 testimony could be conveyed in um, in a in an English language poem of this kind. Um, so yeah, so there's a lot more I could say about that, but I don't want to go on too long about it. Um, the second question was about witnessing, right? And um, yeah, about the sort of outflanking of, of that sort of, again, the, the sort of um, the uh, dis disingenuousness or hi hypocrisy of sort of, so, or, or, it, or trying to outflank a hypocrisy of witness, as it were, or, or mm. the sort of disingenuousness of witness. And I think I was just saying that it's a repeated theme mm. uh, in mm. your critical work, but also in your poetry. Mm. Um, and this poem seems to articulate a lot of those themes that have been there throughout your work. 
Yeah, and the drone pilot in a way stands in for some of these um, these these questions because that's someone who, from a position of of, of great of safety, you know, sitting in an air conditioned uh, shipping compartment somewhere in the Nevada desert, is able to affect people's lives very far away. And thinking about that as a kind of allegory for the poetic imagination and the way that um, the the subaltern can be conjured up within a kind of anti capitalist or critical poetics. Um, as a as a as a figure onto which um, uh, all of the, the the worst predations of these systems can be pinned, so that the, the poet can then critique those those systems, and 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 thinking about that kind of distance and intimacy within the poetics as well as comparably in the in the drone operations um, was part of the 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 attempt to think through what a different kind of committed poetics might actually look like, and. Um, and in terms of performance, I think it, this is, is kind of a related question. So, you know, this is a, a poem that emerged uh, over a, a, a long period where I was revising it for a really long time and thinking about where to place it and so forth. And um, I performed it a lot and I felt like I, I wanted, and, and in the process of that, those performances, I elaborated more and more of a kind of a performative style, um, not in the Austin sense, but in the, um, uh, but, uh, and trying to think about the the, the um, distinguishing the different voices and and being able to actually play with them, and that's partly um, uh, an expression of um, how you know I may not be the Stephen Rutherford's uh, valorized twenty year old charismatic poet anymore, but um, I have reached a position where I feel. Um, more free to express actual vulnerability, and that might not be the vulnerability of of, of um, deep feelings, you know, about romance or uh, the city. Um, but it is a, it's about the vulnerability of not of of not knowing, and also of being clear. And so, um, through uh, a lot of struggle over the years, um, I've been really working hard to kind of shed personally. A kind of character armor that in my poetry is expressed as a defensive obscurity um, and um, trying to, to work out what claims I can actually make in a clear and direct way because it feels like within the urgency of our political moment um, clarity is really important um, but at the same time a clarity that doesn't abandon the, ki the kind of um, complexity of, 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 of thought um, that uh, is embedded in more um, kind of difficult or obscure poetic formations, right? Mm -hmm. So, so there is a kind of a dialectic there between between uh, obscurity and illumination, um, and um, feeling um, feeling like it's possible also to tell um, to tell personal stories very directly. So, to tell the story about being a little girl in West Virginia and um, being forced to fire a gun because this was part of my heritage as an American and the the association between that gun and you know my mom's boyfriend's collection of porn magazines and you know that the the Eros and Thanatos uh, connection there has been you know extensively ther theorized but at the same time it is an actual physical manifestation in the sock drawer um, that I wanted to kind of expose. Um, and so that that is a way also of thinking about my own position within the um, the the kind of uh, political um, conflict that I'm describing in the poem as as an American. That's something that's preoccupied me for a really long time. Um, and um, thinking about the connections between the daily experience of of kind of violence or threat or or, or you know racist um, fantasies of uh, of threat that uh, totally infused my childhood, you know, and the pursuit of these modern imperialist wars. And that those wars have been a real preoccupation of my poetry um, for 20 years because they've been going on all of that time, right? So um, maybe one day they'll, they'll end and I can write poems about something else. But until then, um, it's, you know, I think one of the fundamental um, uh, uh, duties or responsibilities of the of the artist is to figure out ways of engaging with um, these structural realities, not just as something that's happening over there, but which is also present within our most intimate relations.
Yeah, thank you, Andrew. I mean, I think what 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 uh, uh, even though these issues have been going on for the twenty years, and, and therefore you know you're we re, you're revisiting them and everything. I think what you're what you're describing as well is an evolution of your own perspective, or or an evolution of your own voice, if I can put it that way, without sounding too glib. But just uh, just a a, 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 la a lack of reticence to just have to be cryptic all the time in the sense and have to be difficult and obscure because um, I often find um, well we often find in poetry readings that people were reticent to sort of give an explanation or, or yeah. to say something because uh, the poem is the poem and then it should speak for itself and that's very true that's very true in many ways but actually if um, if you're going to you need to sometimes one needs to meet an audience halfway in order to sort of give them a context and understanding and not just mm. sort of beat them over the head with critique as it were and I think so it sounds like you're describing this evolution um, even though the themes are similar and recirculate as they will but an evolution in the way in which you're approaching them in relation to other people as well and, and your readership um, yeah yeah, yeah I, I absolutely agree with that um, and yeah I've moved completely away from that notion that you know the audience has to be tough enough to uh, to appreciate the poem without any kind of extra information or any any um, change of register, uh, you know, any attempt to actually engage with the fact that we're bodies and and in in a room together, right? And we're moving and we're listening and we're we're speaking, and um, that that's this really specific kind of context which ought to be honoured. Um, so yeah, I'm much more invested in performance now than I used to be. Yeah, and it's a much more generous spirit, isn't it? Um, you know, standing and you know the people are there to see you and you know to have actually a conversation with them rather than a sort of you know you are listening to me, etc. Um, so we, we'll go towards the final section of this um, uh, podcast, which is um, uh, some excerpts from Cut from the Rushes. We're not we're not, we're not really going to talk about uh, necessarily this poem, uh, but I thought we thought we would end with this uh, with this excerpt, this last excerpt, and wonder. This was published by Reality Street in two thousand and thirteen, and it's actually the last poem in that collection. Am I right in saying that? Yeah, that's yes. right. So I wonder if you could say something about Cut the Rushes, Cut from the Rushes, and then uh, read it. Yeah, so that's a it's a collection of um, both an older book that was published by um, Robin Purves and Peter Manson's Pressed Ob Object Permanence, and then some more recent poems. And um, I, I've, I've spoken a lot uh, about the poems. I'm not going to say a huge amount, actually. <laughs> that we just said it's important to provide context. Um, but I'm not going to say a huge amount about this poem, but I just thought it might be a nice place for us to uh, leave, because although the, its vision um, is kind of abstract and, and and natural. I think it is actually trying to point towards um, a, a, a different set of possibilities than than um, some of the things that I've been critiquing in the other work that I've read today. So, damaged good. In the clearing, smoke scours the photographs, hiding the animal labor which moves insects and their information all over the face of the earth. I arrive in kind by light rail, transport, rough and undependable, rocking sideways with a peg of metal to make it rat ring erratogenically like spray paint in a cylinder and get my tag up on the boundary stone. Off the peg, on the make, blush to be at ease among gillyflowers where I toss suffering to be carried back by animals, the cabbage moth, the ordinary bee. Chances start out anthological and are redistributed for rationing, for loss looks better and is altogether better in ethic. I am who ties together the navigation menu, all the compassed interests of variety, all three corners of the fading earth. Watch all day the screen in ratio, facing its light and movement with more affect and concentration than the branching face of a lover as these spaces slip into degrees. Two move along their lone specificity, keep an eye on the melancholic hourglass poised beside the leftward arrow of the machine asking us to wait some more. We share one hope and it infuses even the green lipped muscle we eat sickly, the curl of green fringing kale. It bolts up the sky and our assertion that there will be a future clearing the smoke swings from its rootless peg that the blood will root and take turns through all the living work done on the earth to divide and return to us intact. Ours is the most abstract 
and furthest from the truth. Thank you, Andrea. So we'll leave it there. And that's, so that's it for this episode of Talking Poetics. It's just up to me, uh, left to me to thanks our, thank our featured poet, Andrea Brady, for joining us. Thank you so much, Andrea. Thank you so much for having me, Gareth. And to wish you all the best. And we'll see you next time on Talking Poetics. Talking Poetics is a simulcast as both a YouTube video and as a podcast, and the podcast can be found on all of your podcast providers. Just search for Talking Poetics. I've been Gareth Farmer, and see you next time.